realized a few years ago that there was a huge problem with uh, animals kept as pets in Belgium. Uh, but in Belgium, nothing is simple. <laughs> so, um, about seven years ago, the competency about animal welfare was split in, between regions. So now in Belgium, we have three different legislation uh, for keeping pets. So, uh, the story dates back quite a long time ago. In fact, in 1986, um, the minister at that time uh, made a new regulation about pet trade and pet keeping. And there was a line in the law saying, yes, maybe the minister can decide what animals can be kept. And that was all. Uh, in the 90s, they began to think about it and saying, yes, maybe people shouldn't keep tigers at all, or that kind of things. Um, and they start working about a whitelist for mammals. It took them about 15 years. <laughs> and uh, it was only in 2009 that the whitelist for the mammals uh, was written. So, who is concerned by, by this whitelist? Only individuals. So, not the zoo, not the labs, not the shelters, not the vets. Really, only the people that, that want uh, a cap, uh, to keep the pet. Um, so why why white white why writing a white list? Uh, there were safety concerns. Uh, I was joking about the tiger, but really uh, look at the U.S. Uh, sometimes people really try to keep tigers at home, and they are so cute. A few years ago in France, there was a, a black panther escaping from a flat. And uh, it was wandering on the roofs in the city. Uh, I don't know if the French people remember that. So really, it happened. So the idea was, okay, what is a suitable pet? A suitable pet is an animal that it is easy to keep, not dangerous, uh, not invasive, if possible, and with an easy way to find information about them. Um, so 2009. The white list for the mammals. At that time, it was uh, one. The competency was for the whole country, so one list for the whole country. Uh, then we split the competence between regions. And in 2016, the minister of Wallonia was thinking about it, and he, he asked his welfare council about writing the white list for all the vertebrate taxa. Uh, the two other regions follow. So, uh, between 2019 and 2021, we have had least four reptiles uh, for the whole Belgium. As you can see, they are quite generous with a lot of animals on them. And in 2019, the minister asked to work on a whitelist for the fish. So, what does it work? The minister has a question. So there's an animal welfare council to answer that question. When it's about something really weird like fish, no one knows about fish, they're so gluey and you know in water in a jar, oh, we don't know about we like rats, we like pets, we like mammals. So they ask an expert group to work on that. Then the experts write some conclusion, give them to the council, we give an advice to the ministers so who maybe Maybe we do something about it. So first step, we had a working group to set up. Uh, there were representatives of the pet trade, uh, of the animal rights activists and the shelters. Uh, I forgot to write about it on the slide, but we had also representatives of the, the hobby, uh, with the, uh, the hobby clubs. Uh, there was me, biologist specialized in public aquaria. Uh, one member of the administration and one, me one member of the Welfare Council. So, where do we start? Um, when they called me, I was a bit laughing, you know, a bit nervously, like, yeah, do you know how many fish species there are? So, we took a few taxa that we can call fish, and uh, yes, that was more than 30, 
34,000 species. So where do we start now? The first idea was to go to the suppliers and see what they say, what we can buy. Uh, at first, we, we thought that it would be a lazy way to do that, you know, or oh, just take the fish from the storms. But in fact, uh, we had several thousand references from those lists, and that was, that was really hard to sort them out because uh, there were real species, but there were fancy mouths, there were hybrids, there were undescribed species, of course. Uh, it was really impossible to automate the work. And yeah, we could just work on species that were on the trade, but we have to keep, how do we keep it updated? And uh, maybe in two years there will be 100 more species, you know, newly described, newly imported, so that was not a good way to go. So we choose to take fish bays and to import all the species. <laughs> oh, listings, it's listings of species. Um, it was easy, in fact, because I, I could import um, by orders of family all the species list on the list. And for some family, it was really easy, you know, to work because if you have a family of fish that live uh, in the deep, deep, deep waters, okay, you can never keep them as pet. It's easy. Up, oh, one family done. Um, so I'm a fish. I would like to live in a cozy aquarium, or do I get on the list? First, you must be easy to keep. So, the idea that was quite complicated was um, the animal must be suitable, suitable for beginner. But what is beginner? You know, uh, as we had with representative from the trade, um, what we find easy is very different. Um, for them, you know, if you have a fish that lives in really soft water, acidic, now it's easy to keep, just by a river, so small is What's the problem? <laughs> and then you're, yes, but the beginner doesn't know it's reverse osmosis, so uh, quite a long discussion about that. The temperature range must be easy to keep. So if you have a fish species that lives at uh, maybe 10 degrees Celsius, it's not easy in a living room, so you can not live in a living room. Um, not, you must not be too difficult about the lighting. For fish, it's usually not a problem, uh, apart maybe for cave fish, but uh, we were thinking for the following steps and maybe corals, you know. Uh, water, para water parameters must be easy to recreate. Water flow and uh, suitable habitat for your physiological and behavioral needs. You must be easy to feed. Uh, the food must be available in shops and you cannot um, you, you cannot eat live fish, <laughs> no live feeder fish. But like I told you earlier, really uh, being easy is really subjective. So it was uh, for each species, it's sometimes a discussion. Uh, for example, discus. I think that discus are not easy fish. But for the, the, the trade, oh, they're easy. You just need some material. Uh, there are species that are quite easy, but people never buy them for the good reason. So, the, uh, the clown roach, yes, they are, not, they are big, but they are not, not so difficult. But why do people buy them? Not because they are beautiful, or not because they like them, but because they were told that they would eat the snails in the aquarium. So, it's not good for the fish welfare. That's not a good reason to have a pet. Mm -hmm. The most easy criteria was don't be too big, please. <laughs> and it was really easy to assess with fish bays. Uh, I don't know if you recognize the fish. It's a red tail catfish. Uh, it's really big, but uh, they are really quite often sold and uh, they are sold at that size. And uh, I mean, they are one of my favorite fish. They are so smart and they are so curious and they are looking at you through the glass. So, of course, people want them, but they don't realize that they, they get so big. So, we are thinking, what is the maximum size of an aquarium that you can buy in the trade? The, the really biggest one that, that we could find was two meters long. That's really generous, but that was the biggest one that we could find. So, what, what fish can I put inside? 
we used um, a formula that JM does, the Toledo Zoo Aquarium Curators made, and it says, okay, if you have a fish that likes to swim, uh, maybe he needs about an aquarium that is about six times his length. So he can swim, you know, a little before turning around. Um, so we made some mathematics and we got a fish with a maximum size of about 35 centimeters. If the fish is sedentary, it moves less. So the idea is that it needs about five times its length. So you can have a bigger fish. Yeah, so it was easy. Uh, we took data from fish base on Excel sheets and uh, we could sort them quite easy and uh, all the fish in red, you know, forget about it. Uh, but the results were quite generous because Jim Dahl revised his, he revised his formula and now it talks about more like eight times the length of the fish. And I think it's better, I mean, six times the length of the fish, that's not such a long line to swim, you know. And the standard aquaria that you can find in the trade, they are not two meters long, they are more often one and a half meters. Even if you can find an aquarium suitable for your fish in the trade, that doesn't mean that the people will buy that aquarium. You are an artist species, healthy, not too stressed, uh, not too prone to disease, but to assess that, you cannot do it automatically. You have to have the knowledge of the species. Um, we don't want invasive species, but again, um, you need to assess the species as it's complicated and it takes time. Uh, we don't have any in indigenous species, so we don't risk that people will go to the river and catch the fish them by themselves. Uh, we would like to have that the, the trade is not a threat to the ecosystems, but yes, you can have the IUCN status or the CITES, but you, uh, you can have captive bred animals, so that's not so easy. You have to know if the species is uh, captive bred or not. And the uh, captive bred versus taken in the wild is really a long discussion, because we know that uh, in some regions of the world, uh, capturing the, individual, the, the, the fish from the wild, it can be an incentive to protect uh, the ecosystem. Uh, you must not be a threat to your owner, please. So at first, it's about animal welfare, but there's a reason. If you are dangerous, there are quick chance that uh, the owner is mi will mishandle you. You know, uh, like, oh, he bites me. I won't put the, the end in the aquarium anymore. Uh, oh, it's venomous. I don't know how to catch it. You must be well known. Uh, people must be able to find documentation to take care about you quite easily, and not, you know, in an old reference book from the 80s or like, no, it must be really, I googled the name and I find information. So now, uh, we've worked on about 9,000 species. We still have a lot of, of species to do, and uh, we must talk about the, the main hobby taxa, like the Cyclidae, the Persiform, the Cyloriforms. Um, there's a big discussion about uh, animal wild capture. There's other discussion about hybrids and about fancy morphs. Uh, for example, for goldfish, uh, if you have the bubble ones with big head, they cannot really swim, they are so slow. Uh, there are some the parrot fish, uh, not the real parrot fish from the wild, uh, an hybrid of freshwater species. They have such a strange mouth that it's really difficult for them to eat. Uh, so for me, there's a real welfare problem with the fancy moths. And uh, it's a huge one. So we cannot do it once and it's over. There are, I, I mean, for mammals, it was easy. Uh, maybe once in 10 years, we do a, a revision. But for fish, there are quite often new species on the market and new species described. So how do we keep it updated? So thank you guys for all the work you did on fish base. It, it made the job quite easier. First, we had to choose a taxonomic reference just to get uh, an idea of the fish species that exist. Uh, but fish base was first really recognized. 
And then it's a comprehensive source of information. I can find information on the diet, on the ecosystem, on the length of the fish. So all I need is in fish base. And that was really important because if you don't find everything at the same place, you can become picky, you know? Yes, but in that book, the maximum size is 15 centimeters, not 21. So it's a small species, I can keep it. Yes, but in that side, it's, it's said that uh, you can feed them with flakes really easy. And uh, on fish, if on fish base, it's, you know, obligated carnivores. Hmm, I'm not sure. And uh, the, poss the possibility of importing the data from fish base to Excel sheets and then working on them, it was really fast to work. So, if I could have a wish list, <laughs> like yesterday, um, I would say that what would have been really useful was a list about species that are not described yet. I know that I am asking a lot that uh, you work on described species, but if, you, if we could have a, a trace somewhere, of what's the, what's, uh, the work in progress about description. You know all the L numbers, the C numbers. There are many species, we know that they exist and that, that someone is working on them. Just a list, it could be nice. And um, yes, I told you just before that it was easy to import data, but sometimes they are not so easy to import if you don't know what future base. But uh, it's all already what I told you yesterday. Sometimes being more user friendly for the baby user like us that are not used to fish base, but just uh, usually go to the fish sheet, data sheet, and are not used to play with fish base and to get all the information. Sometimes it's not easy to import the data. So, in conclusion, uh, we use fish base as a taxonomic reference. It was really useful to have all the data gathered in one single website. Uh, the scientific credibility was a huge point because no one could argue about it. And uh, the free access was really important. I work for a university, so for me it's quite easy to get access to scientific literature, but not my colleagues from the group. So fish base, it was easy because everyone could go there and get the information and be sure and be actor of the process. So thank you very much.